He is a Bassmaster Open winner, a classic qualifier, an elite series champion. And this week, we try to crack into the crystal fortress of solitude that is Caleb Kufal on... I'm Bob Cobb for the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. Welcome back to the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast. Happy hump day to all my humpers. It is Wednesday and that is when you'll find this show each and every week, Wednesday at 6 p.m. And I thank you all for listening to it. I have one favor to ask you. Make sure when you, now or after at some point, make sure you like this video. It makes a big difference. It helps us. It's basically your way of, of clapping on YouTube. I know it sounds trivial. I know it sounds juvenile but it really helps us grow and get bigger and better and, and do more of this kind of stuff. And I thank you for that. Speaking of growing, just a week ago, we passed 80,000 YouTube subs. When we started this show, we had 35,000 YouTube subs. So thank you, all of you. And uh, for those who listen on the streaming platform, drop stars and reviews and likes and all that stuff. Let that, let that platform know that you like listening to what we do here week after week and is in we meaning me talking to this and talking to whoever our guest is and this week's guest is a different one um one of the cool things about the elite series is it's a group of people from around the world that come together and a lot of those people um where they grew up, they felt like an outsider just because fishing isn't a mainstream sport like a lot of other sports. I mean, you play football, it's easy to find other people that want to play football. Um, if you're into fishing and if you're into competitive fishing, there's just only so many people that are into it. So the cool thing is you see in the Elite Series is everybody comes together and what may have been a group of outsiders in other places all of a sudden they're all accepted and all of a sudden they feel like they fit and um, they're all different, you know, and the truth is not everybody is Gerald Swindle. Not everybody's Matt Robertson. Uh, not everybody's Brandon Polnick and the list goes on and on. People that have no problem communicating that are, that are an open book. Some of the folks in the lead series are just, just quiet folks that love fishing. And, and I'm sure some of you people listening here, are just quiet folks that love fishing. And our guest this week is one of those dudes. And um, you don't see him on a lot of podcasts for that particular reason, I imagine. You know, with everything he's accomplished, you would think he'd be on podcasts all the time, but you don't see him a lot. And I can guarantee you it's because most people look at it and be like, ooh, this will be a tough interview. Um, and it may very well be, but it's also what attracts me to doing this particular interview because I want to know more about this dude and hopefully in a little while all of us will know more about him he is a two-time Bassmaster winner one from the Opens one from the Elite Series a classic qualifier he weighed in what may have been the quietest 103 pounds and one ounces just a few weeks ago at Santee without further ado Caleb Kufal Caleb Kufal this is the world's most awkward uh, blind date. I mean, we have worked together for several years, and you've won an elite series event. I mean, you weighed in a hundred and what, one hundred and two or one hundred and three pounds? Did you weigh one hundred and three? One hundred and three one. Yeah, yeah. one hundred and three one. I should know more about you. How come you are a crystal fortress of solitude? You're you're a fairly quiet person, I think. Y yeah, I, I don't think I'm that quiet, you know, personally. But I guess you know, once you get to know me, I'm I'm kind of a loud mouth, but. Uh, you know, it's just, I don't know. It's just one of those things I've kind of been, you know, more standoffish, off -ish, you know, just, uh, not one to really, you know, start up conversations or, you know, stuff like that. So it's just me. So, so there is a loudmouth side to you though. We just have not unearthed it yet. A little bit. Yeah. I mean, once you get to know me, then, you know, then the words start flowing a little bit, a little bit freer, but, uh, you know, it's just, yeah, I'm kind of tight. I'm kind of tight. So tell me about this past weekend, 103 pounds, one ounce, um, incredible number one, but, but to be the only person in history to do it with 19 fish and, and to be that close to getting your second elite series victory. 
you had a 16 hour drive home. What, 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 where are you at with that? Is this all a positive or are you like, man, it could have been so good? Oh, both. Obviously, you know, you get that close. You don't get that many opportunities on the elite series to, you know, to get a win. And if you're that close, you know, you definitely want to nail it down, but um, you know, it's just, I don't know. I didn't think about it a whole lot. You know, I didn't sleep well the last couple of nights on the other side of things. So, you know, it did bother me to a certain extent, but, um, you know, generally, you know, I really believe that when it's your time, it's your time to win. And, you know, if it, if it was meant to be, I'd have, I'd have won that tournament. I'd, I'd have caught more, one more big one at the end of the day, or, you know, caught one more fish on Friday. But, you know, it's just one of those things that I mean, you can't, I mean, Drew Cook, you know, he was meant to win that tournament, you know, he, he led it wire to wire and, um, and good for him. I'm, I'm happy for him, you know, getting his first elite series win. And, um, you know, I know what it, what it meant to me last year. So, um, you know, it's just, it's just one of those things it's fishing. And, you know, if I had to go back and, and do it all over again, I'd do the same thing. So. Yeah. And to clear the matters up where you got hurt was day two, only four mm-hmm. fish and you had what 13 and change on day two. 13 even. Yeah. 13 pounds. So did you ever have a fifth fish on that day? I had four bites and landed all four of them. So I did not have a, a fifth bite even that I know of, you know, much less having one hooked up that I just didn't land. Um, which is ironic. I mean, it's just, I had a really good practice. Uh, I went out the first day of practice. I got 26 pounds pretty quick. Um, second day of practice, I think I caught 25 and then third day I caught 20 three, something like that. So, I mean, I I was on, you know, bigger fish, but I was not getting that many bites. I was getting five to 10 bites a day. Um, and it just so happened that Friday was one of those days where I just didn't, didn't get them ended up with four bites, but I fished really clean all week. Uh, there was not one fish that would have helped me, you know, that came off. I think I lost like two fish all week and they were just like two to three pounders. So, um, you know, it's just, it's just the way it goes. Yeah. And maybe that may, and does that make it easier to know? Like, I mean, you weighed in your maximum weight every day you could. And I mean, you can't really blame it on anything other than having four in day two, but you never had an opportunity at it. So does that, like, if you had a, had a two pounder on, I'm sure that would haunt you, you know, oh. that one fish that got off. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be that close, you know, and have it, have it slip away would, uh, would, I wouldn't get any sleep for weeks, but, um, (laughs) you know, as it went down, I mean, you know, going through your mind and stuff, what decisions could I have made throughout the day, maybe to give me a better chance to, to get that fifth bite. Um, you know, I had number four fairly, you know, quick uh, noon, one o'clock, something like that. I think I had like two or three hours to, to catch wow. that last fish, but it just never happened. I moved around, tried to make it happen. You know, I thought, well, I got this amount of time, you know, I should be able to get one more bite. Um, but yeah, it just didn't happen. Just didn't happen. And, and like you said, when it's meant to be, and that, that is one of those things that drives me crazy about tournament anglers, but I do feel like in our sport, like for example, your win last year, I mean, I think you won by 17 pounds. I mean, it was like you fished an extra day in the tournament over the field. And and clearly that was one where you were meant to win. How did you win that tournament? Like it, that one still puzzles me because it's on a lake like Gunnersville, you very rarely see somebody dominate and it wasn't like you were doing something that nobody else was doing. It it was just, you had the, the perfect zone. Is that what you would explain it to? It's everything just clicked that week. I mean, it, from the get go, I mean, I, I, I caught a fish on my second flip of the day on, on day one to get me off to a good start. And, you know, I think like a half an hour, an hour later, I was catching, you know, back to back five and six pounder. Um, so, you know, I got off to a really good start that tournament and, you know, just didn't really look back. I mean, the, the, the tournament just kind of unfolded. I never really got in a jam, um, you know, where I really wasn't generating any, any bites, but, um, you know, again, you know, it was just, just my time to win that tournament. You know, it was, it was great. I wouldn't trade for the world. Okay. Well, we know all this kind of stuff we're talking about, but I want to learn about you. So where are you right now? Um, I'm at home in McGuanago, Wisconsin, uh, 
and I'm just I'm just chilling for the next couple of days. We're gonna leave for uh, Chickamauga in one week from today, so looking forward to that. McGuanago, Wisconsin. Explain to me what 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 kind of t- is big town, little town? Like describe it to me. It's a yeah, it's a little town. Um, I've lived here for probably. 20 some years something like that uh, i used oh, wow. to live in wauwatosa actually my first 12 years of life or whatever before uh, coming out here but um it's in a little, little subdivision uh, we're about probably half hour 45 minutes uh west of milwaukee so um you know southeast wisconsin okay but there are uh two really small lakes in this subdivision uh, like 10 to 15 anchors and that is pretty much where i got my start bass fishing the thing is chuck full of bass and every chance i get i go out there and, and catch fish and um that's pretty much what taught me how to fish so do you i mean you went to school you went to high school and everything right there i was i was actually homeschooled so oh wow uh, yeah i never went to school i was all this adds to the the crystal fortress of solitude the homeschooling it man. might it might just a bit <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. Why, why were you homeschooled? Sports. Just a choice by your parents? or Yeah, there wasn't anything wrong with me or anything. You know, no, I don't mean a, that. A <laughs> Maybe your parents were rock stars and they traveled, so you had to be homeschooled. Uh, I was not No, implying. yeah, no, no, no. It was, uh, it was a purely decision on their part. Um, and I don't know. I've probably got a better education because of it. But probably. Um, all my brothers, too. Uh, I have three brothers. All right. One, one older, two younger. And, uh, and they've been homeschooled too. What do they think of this whole fishing gig? Like, do they have regular jobs? Uh, yeah. Um, they watch me as much as they can. I know my, my older brother, he had the, the TV on, you know, playing live on Monday, uh, cheering me on with all his, you know, coworkers and stuff. But, um, you know, I got another brother that, uh, that works from home, you know, so he gets the opportunity to, to watch as well. So, but I got, you know, tons of support around the house here, you know, it's just crazy. I got, you know, friends and and family cheering me on, texting me all the time. And um, yeah, it's just great. So you said before I rudely interrupted you when we got on the home home homeschool thing, you were saying you played a lot of sports growing up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I played a fair amount of baseball growing up. And then uh, as soon as I got out of high school, um, kind of switched over to more hockey uh, and then softball as well. And I, I kind of dropped hockey, but I'm still playing some softball um, just on a local league around here. Uh, we've been playing ever since I got out of high school. So, um, you know, we're not that good, but we have a lot of fun. So that's what counts. That That's really why most people play softball, really. I mean, do you guys go out afterwards? Is, is there beer drinking in Wisconsin after you play softball? I would... Maybe. a little bit a little a bit. little bit. I actually i actually don't drink at all so that's not at all i don't drink any you know nothing water that's, that's pretty much it it's rare yeah. in wisconsin is it not like my not, rare. To, not to paint everyone with a brush but in wisconsin minnesota people like they they i mean i figure it's just cold and we have no choice just like people from ontario that you just that's what we're we're known for is our beer drinking up here that's uh that's just kind of what we do but um, you know, not me. I just, I never, I never liked it. I never acquired a taste for it or anything. So <laughs> it's just, it's just me. So what, what, explain to me what you do outside of the elite series. So if you have next weekend free and you don't have a tournament to prep for or anything and you got, you could do anything, what, what would you do? What would a perfect Saturday, Sunday be for Caleb Kufal? Go fishing, go fishing. Uh, we got, I got 30 to 40 lakes, uh, within probably an hour of the house here. And, uh, man, I, nothing better than I, I'm all about fishing. I mean, that's since I was, I can't remember how old, I mean, it used to be just, it was my only pastime really. I mean, just to, to get out there in the, in the outdoors and, you know, just to enjoy it. I am, uh, I'm a, I'm a tinkerer. Uh, I do make a lot of my own baits. Uh, you know, I got a fairly decent size work workshop in the basement and, um, you know, I love making my own, you know, jigs and spinner baits and buzz baits, jig heads. You know, I got into soft plastic pouring uh, a couple of years ago. I've done, done a lot of that. So, um, I like, uh, you know, tweaking, tweaking baits and stuff like that. So that's cool. That's cool. So did you get into fishing, as fishing or did you 
when did the tournament thing become part of it? Was it all at the same time or as you fished more, you wanted to test yourself in tournaments? Do you remember? Yeah, definitely. Uh, starting out, um, you know, when I was younger, my grandfather actually used to live in a, a local lake near the house here. Um, and he got me started early, you know, I'm talking like three, four years old, uh, just catching bluegills off the dock. And that kind of morphed into, you know, moving out here, fishing the lakes, getting more into bass. Um, you know, that was more like my, my 12 to, you know, 16 years old. Um, and then I kind of got the itch. I'm like, man, I want to try, you know, this tournament thing. So, um, I bought my first boat when I was 17, 18 years old, something like that. And, uh, I went as a co-angler for a couple of years. I didn't, uh, didn't go straight up as a boater right away, but, um, I started, you know, fishing just around the house, little club deals and, um, you know, I fished a lot on the, uh, the FLW side, um, I actually fished over a hundred tournaments with them before I even fished one with bass. So I've been over there, you know, quite a bit, but, uh, you know, I just kind of gained momentum through that circuit. You know, I started in the yeah. BFLs and, um, did really well, ended up fishing the Everstarts. And then I actually fished the FLW tour, um, the top level for five years as a co-angler, uh, just learning from, a lot of those guys. And actually, um, a lot of the guys that I was out of the the back of the boat back then, um, I'm fishing against now. I can remember drawing out, uh, Clark Wendell and, um, I had a number of guys that are, that are still on tour. Jay Ellis. Um, I drew him out a couple of times and, um, you know, just a great learning experience. So that's kind of how I got my start. You always hear the stories from the front of the boat, about the guy in the back of the boat, do you have any nightmare experiences? And I don't want you to give a name because I know you won't tell me the story if you give a name, but anybody, I mean, it's not always perfect in the back of the boat, is it? I it's mean, terrible. A reason people move. There's a reason I quit. Yeah. 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 I, you can only take so much of that in the back of the boat. You know, I don't care You know who you're paired with. And I got paired with some great guys. Um, but uh, after a while, you kind of like, you know, maybe we should be going over there, you know, not, staying here and not catching nothing. And, um, just, you want to make your own decisions after a while and, and see how you stack up. So. So you're here now and you're winning at FLW. Did it come at the back of the boat or, or was it a BFL? Or I know you have one win at FLW, don't you? I, yeah, I only have one win in uh, FLW competition. It was a BFL in 2012, uh, from the front of the boat in La Crosse, Wisconsin. So I'm looking forward to getting back there in the fall for sure. I haven't been there actually for a couple of years, um, but I love that body of water. Uh, it's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing body of water. And, and I love how it, it offers different things every time you go. Um, but so how much experience do you have there in lacrosse? I have actually, I mean, I'm not a local. I live about three hours away, um, but I have, I have quite a bit of experience out there. I fished BFLs for years out there, and I think they had three, uh, three tournaments every year um, that they went out of lacrosse pool eight. So uh, I got a lot of experience there, fished a number of other club tournaments and stuff out of that pool. Um, I know seven pretty well too. I don't know nine as well. Um, I plan on probably spending a lot of time out there, uh, this year before, um, before we can't fish anymore. So. Yeah, it's, it's good. That's going to be a fun way to finish off the season up there. I'm, I'm looking forward to that event. Um, it has the most bars per capita again, uh, not making me understand at all why you don't drink because everywhere there is drinking, but I will do my share for you while we're there. Um, yeah, it's big up there. Oh, it's huge. It's huge. It's a, it's a, it's a sport. Drinking is actually yeah. a sport. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, what is your life like on tour? I mean, I've heard different things, but do you still live in your truck or, or have you moved out of the truck? I do. I actually, uh, I live in the back of the, the tundra in a six and a half foot box. So, uh, it's been my home for the last, you know, three, four years, whatever. Um, but I, I don't know that I, I'm not ready to change quite yet. Uh, I think it's, it suits me well, um, for now. Um, but last year I kind of, I thought about changing after winning, you know, I got a yeah. couple of dollars in my pocket and I'm like, well, maybe I should go out and buy a, a truck camper or something like that. But, um, you know, the trucks are kind of hard to come by right now. I need a new truck and, you know, campers too. So I thought, well, I'll wait at least one more year and 
see what happens then. But um, I camp with, uh, you know, Bob Downing and myself. Uh, we we kind of stay together at a lot old of Bob. these. And old Bob. Old Bob Downing. Um, Pat, Sh- uh, Pat Schlapper has kind of gotten in the mix too now. Um, he's he's kind of one of our guys now too. So um, super guy. I'll tell you. He really of is. Are Both of them. Both awesome those guys. guys are great yeah. guys. I can't Be- say enough about them. Do you think the whole living in the truck thing almost helps in some ways? Because, you know, like it's not that comfortable if it's a miserable day to go back and lay in the back of your pickup truck. Um, So you stay on the water. You know, it almost feels like when people live in the back of their truck, as weird and obscure as that sounds to people who have a regular job, it almost helps them focus. It's kind of like the Rocky boot camp where you just beat the crap out of a side of beef as opposed to a punching bag it it does you know like you said it kind of forces you to be on the water because you don't want to be sitting in your <laughs> truck so you know it kind of um kind of forces you into it that way um but yeah i mean i it's been i mean as far as like climate control in that box i mean it's <laughs> heat isn't a problem you know i can always get get heat but it's the air conditioning that that's the problem you know once we go to to some of these places i'll tell you I, end of 2020 when when we had the whole you know covid delay thing yeah. and we had a lot of our fall tournaments so that darn near killed me i mean that 100 degrees in a in a box is not, <laughs> it's no. not fun but uh yeah i you know i'll do it for another, at least another year so is is that the worst part about living in that box is is the heat or or what else like what absolutely i would just think that like your crap always being just three inches from your face. Yeah, that's <laughs> that would be bothersome to me. You know, like where's my clothes? Well, it's under me. I gotta find it. Uh, um, it's tight. So- it's tight. I'll tell you, there's not a whole lot of, of room to move. But um, I'm a pretty small. Well, yeah, I'm, not, I'm kind of a big bone guy, but I'm not that tall, so I'm not a huge guy. And you know, moving around in there isn't isn't all that bad, but. Um, I got it set up pretty well, though. I got a TV in there, you know, DVD player. I got, uh, you know, a nice heater. I got a, a battery set up in there just in case I don't have power uh, so that I can, you know, run a heater or something overnight if it's cold. Um, you know, run lights. I got, you know, lighting set up in there. Uh, you know, bought a brand new cooler this last year. That's working out great. Um, you know, just the little things, you know, yeah. it's working out. So for you, it's just you just want to be on the water at all times. I mean, it- is that what I'm like? You don't get off the. I would assume living that lifestyle, you don't get off the water early in pre-fish. I mean, it, it goes to the bitter end. Bitter end, bitter end, absolutely. Um, I must say, I do like the day off, uh, just to kind of gather out the your camper. gather air your out. thoughts, air out the camper. Yeah, get all your tackle <laughs> situated, get ready, clear your head. You know, um, it is nice not having to get off the water that that last night a uh, uh, practice especially if you're having a hard practice you want to stay out as long as you can um but yeah I, I enjoy that that day off but it's uh what is your goal like but when i look at your career it's amazing what you've accomplished i mean like you said you fished 100 or so events at flw you've fished a quarter of that i believe at bass right now and you've got two wins one in the opens and one in the elite series and let's be honest, you were two pounds away from a win. And I know two pounds seems a lot. And a lot of tournaments, like when you get to lacrosse, to win by two pounds is almost unthinkable. But two pounds in Santee is really, is nothing. I mean, your your fish probably defecated that much in your live well throughout the week. So you, you've had such big highlights. But you've also, like, it's a very up and down pattern if you look at it. What do you attest that to? Is that learning fisheries is that do you have a winner take all attitude like what why would you say you're so up and down so i think most of it i mean when when i was you know growing up doing all these different tournament trails and stuff uh you know i was very consistent i won a lot of aois and stuff like that you know i was consistent in every single tournament that i fished um and i always finished high on the points um but i think the reason for it being so up and down now is that uh i don't get to to pick the the trail that we fish, you know, I could always pick schedules and stuff, uh, you know, fisheries that I wanted to go to and, you know, that I felt I could do good in. And now we're fishing, 
you know, fully serious schedule that's diverse. I mean, we go everywhere, a uh, lot of different fisheries, you know, whether it's smallmouth, largemouth, spotted bass, shallow, deep, you know, you got to know everything. And I think that's, that's why I've had so many ups and downs, you know, I'm, I'm good at the, the bodies of water that I kind of know and fit in my comfort zone and feel good with fishing. Um, but when we go someplace like, um, I hate to say it, but like Waddington, I mean, you know, a, 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 a lake that, or a river system, that's really odd to me, you know, uh, just, I'm not comfortable there. Um, and I think that's why it's been just a roller coaster. But how can you be a guy from the North? I mean, yeah, everybody paints Northern dude. Like, you, I mean, well, it's the same thing. You know, we talked about it this weekend, like Corey and stuff like that. Everybody thinks they're just smallmouth guys, but you guys spend a lot of time largemouth fishing. But what, what about Waddington puts you off? I mean, I, I could see it be a tough place to compete because it's so hard to make, you know, to make up the ground, like, to, you know, mm-hmm. but, I, but I should stop answering the question and wait for your answer. Well, well, why do you dislike that fishery at this point in your career? I, I kind of pulled it out. I had a little bit. I, I don't really dislike it. I made the cut there uh, in 2020. I think I missed it last year, but um, you know, it's just one of those deals with the, with the current and everything, yeah. um, you know, fishing deep like that. I, I wasn't prepared the first year that we went there to fish that deep. I mean, I was like, yeah, you know, we'll fish in like, you know, 10 to 15 feet or something like that, you know, but you know, a lot of these guys are fishing like 35 feet. It's like, man, I never, (laughs) I never get that deep, you know, but I don't know. It is what it is. I'm learning as I go, you know, and, and we'll uh, actually in, in 2020, I, uh, I fished for largemouth the majority of that tournament. And I don't know, I might do that again this year. We'll, we'll see. But I mean, oh. it's a great fishery, whether you're fishing largemouth or smallmouth. But, um, you know, like you said before, though, you know, being a northern guy, every, everybody expects you to be a, a smallmouth guru. And I'm not. I hate smallmouth. I mean, I'm largemouth through and through. And that goes back to whenever. I mean, everybody everybody going into the elites was like, man, you got to get better at that small mouth, you know, but um, you know, maybe someday. <laughs> why, why do you hate small mouth? This is, <laughs> I mean, that is one of the oddest things I've ever heard, especially from somebody from Wisconsin. I mean, it, it, when a guy from Texas tells me they hate small mouth, I get it because you've never grown up around them. But I mean, you've had opportunity to catch them your life. No. Oh yeah, absolutely. We've got a lot of lakes around here that, um, you know, that have tons of smallmouth in it. And, I mean, I don't mind catching them. They're fun. Um, I guess it's, you know, largemouth are so, you can catch them on so many different things. You know, it's like yeah. anything you want to do, you can catch a largemouth on. Where smallmouth, it's a little bit more refined, you know. I mean, it's like drop shot in a tube, jerk bait, you know. You can, it, you're a little bit more limited there. Um but I, I don't know. I, I just, I don't like the idea of here today and gone tomorrow. You know, I want them to stay where they are and large generally do that. And smallies don't. So. That's a good point. Good point. Why, why is Alabama so good for you? I mean, both your wins, it has Alabama traditionally always been good to you or is it just, that's where you were, where it was time to win. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of the fisheries down there kind of suit my style. Um, Either that or, you know, just the, the, the tournaments that I fished there, um, you know, just ended up lining up perfectly, you know, weather-wise and, you know, just finding the right stuff and that. But um, I've always done pretty good in, good in Alabama. I think that was, uh, you know, that's always been a really good state for me. Um, I can't name anything off the top of my head, yeah. you know, other tournaments that I've done good there in the past. But, um, you know, I'll take the two wins. So that's great. What is your goal? I mean, uh, two wins is pretty impressive, but what is, I mean, you got into this with an overall goal, I'm sure. What is it? Survival. That That's my, my one and only goal. Um, I know, you know, talking to a lot of the different lead series pros and stuff, uh, you know, a lot of them say you need like four or five years in the sport to kind of solidify yourself and, and feel comfortable where you are and, um, you know, to know that you're going to be around for, for a while. And I think that for me, um, it is, it's just survival. I want to be there. I want to be there for the long haul. And that's just what I'm working towards. You know, I got to make those 
those bad tournaments, those, you know, those bad ones be forties and fifties instead of seventies, eighties. Um, you know, I need to be, be better in the points, uh, for sure. I was, uh, I was close to the classic the last couple of years, uh, yeah. in 2020, I missed it by two or three spots. And then last year, two or three spots. So I'm right there. You know, I just need to have a couple more, you know, decent events or not so much bad ones. Well, what is, um, obviously I'm assuming you, you learn more and more every year, like everybody does, but what is the biggest difference between you today versus when you first joined the elite series? What, like, is there something that stands out that you're like, I had to change this or I had to stop doing this? Um, I, I think a lot of it was mental, um, you know, getting into the elite series, it's, uh, it's a huge stepping stone. And, and, you know, ever since I was young, you know, I, it's always been about bass, you know, it's always been about bass master and watching the bass masters classic, you know, all these guys, you know, the, the yeah. top names that are out there and, you know, to actually uh, break into the, to the league and, and to fish with a lot of these guys, you know, sure you get starstruck and that, you know, just fishing with, dude, I fished against Rick Clun, you know, yeah. it's like, yeah, he stays at the campground, you know, I mean, I, I talk to him now, it's like, unreal, you know, it's just like, all I get of a sudden that. you're there. Yeah. And, and that's, it's, it's, uh, it's intimidating, you know, it's really intimidating to the, the young guys, you know, that are just breaking in and, and that, but, um, you know, I just, I just hope to keep doing it. Well, one thing you always hear from people is, and it, it, I mean, they, everybody hears it going in, but it just almost seems like the hardest thing to do is to fish their own style. Like you hear people don't listen to Doc Talk, do your own thing, but it does seem like a, a huge percentage of the rookies come in and and you see them a few years later, they start to get success and they're like, yeah, I never should have listened. Did you find yourself falling into that? And, and why is that such a hard trap for so many to avoid? I really, I really didn't, uh, you know, Getting me there, you know, through the opens in 2019, um, I solely did my strengths. I mean, I ran with with what I felt that I could, you know, do good in. I didn't do anything, you know, else off the wall or anything crazy. Um, and I kind of carried that into the Elite Series. I'm like, well, if I'm here, you know, if I'm meant to be here, I'm not going to change who I am. I'm not going to, you know, I'm a shallow water fisherman. I'm not going to go out deep, you know, staring at live scope, trying to catch them on a jerk bait. You know, I'm going to be up in the mud flipping a jig and, um, you know, and that. So I, I've kind of carried that, but at the same time, um, you know, we mentioned, you know, the diverse, diverse fisheries that we go to um, and I need to learn that too. So when the time comes and you have to go out deep doing the live scope thing, you know, throwing your jerk bait around, um, you know, I got to be able to do that stuff too. So yeah, there's no room on the elites. It, that's a big thing that's changed, if you ask me. Like, there was a time where you could be a flipper and, you know, you'd do okay. You, you, you'd have your moments mm -hmm. where you were at way up high. And, and same with – take any technique. I mean, it just – it seems like you got to be super well-versed in everything. And I think that's the biggest difference when you see the collegiate anglers come along, in my opinion, because they were forced to do things. You know what I mean? Like – you know, their coach won't let them fish for largemouth when they go to Waddington. <laughs> <laughs> right. But yeah. You I know mean, what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and you know, I just got to make sure that I'm y y fairly decent at those other things that, you know, I can cash a check, you know, when, when those type of events come around. Um, but I also have to, to stick with what I'm good at, you know, in those tournaments, when they come around, I got to make sure that I'm, doing my old school thing and, you know, uh, make sure that those events are, are generally really good for me. What does joining the century club mean to you? It means a lot. I mean, it's, it's a feather in your cap for sure. You know, it's, it's not so much the, you know, showcasing the angler, I think as it is showcasing the, the fishery. I mean, um, you know, everything's got to line up perfectly, uh, to weigh in that kind of weight anywhere you go. Um, but you know, for me personally, it's, uh, you know, it's just another one of those things I, to be honest with you. I never even thought about it all day long. Um, on day four on Monday, I just, uh, I just kept fishing and, um, I never knew about it until my, my cameraman said, Hey man, I think you're over a hundred. I'm like, 
hundred what, you know, but, uh, super happy for it though. I mean, it's, it's great. You know, it's, uh, definitely a milestone. Yeah. And I, and I don't think it's one of those things that people dream of because it's just so rare. I mean, there's yeah. many hall of famers that have never joined the century club. I mean, everything has to add up. You have to be on the fish at, there's just so there's only so many events that that's even a possibility. Um, right. And, and to be at an event where, where two people cracked, it was pretty impressive and almost a little heartbreaking. Cause you're like, you weighed in 103 pounds, you should win. Um, but uh, you, you get it. Um, Davey Hyde said on day two to me, he said, he's fishing the exact area and the exact way that I would have fished this tournament. Did, did you know that? And, and what does that say? Like I'm in the hall of famer to be like, did that give you confidence? He, he when I was weighing in my fish on uh, on the third day, uh, he was right at the the scales or not the scales, but the dump table yeah. or whatever bump table. And uh, and he said, "Hey man, you're fishing my fish." And I'm like, I'm like "Well, he's like, he's like, that's a good area, <laughs> you know." So, uh, but Davey, he's super cool. Um, you know, a legend, legend in the sport, you know, love the guy to death. He does everything for live. Um, you know, he's one of you guys. So, yeah, he's, um, he's a great dude. He yep. is, uh, who, who'd yep. you grow up? Was there any standout folks that you like, you know, you said you've always been a fan of bass. Were there any anglers growing up that that's the dude I want to be like, or that's, that's who I like. I mean, as Rick Lund, Rick Lund has always been an inspiration. Um, that guy, what he's done, over his career uh, is just unbelievable. I mean, winning four classics like that, you know, just being there every year and um, doing it for the amount of years. I don't know how many years he's been doing this, but it's, it's a lot. And um, I, think it's I just, <laughs> I see, really, I think it's 48 years. Like it's almost 50 years. It's ridiculous incredible. when you think about it. Like it's, um, incredible and i was you know fortunate enough uh you know he camps too and i camp and um i'm not good friends with him but uh he we have talked you know a little bit this last week and uh it's just special i mean when that yeah. guy opens his mouth you better listen because you know he's he's been there he's seen it all yeah I, I always tell him that i'm like you're the exact opposite of me i just keep flapping my gums and every once in a while something comes out that makes sense Whenever he moves his mouth, it makes sense. I mean, it really, you do feel like you're spending time with Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, yep. And, yep. and, and I, and I, I know my answer to this, but growing up watching Rick Clun and being like, wow, that guy's amazing. And now that you actually know Rick Clun, how much more is it? it? Because for me, it's, I mean, I thought Rick Clun was cool and accomplished a lot, but man, almost weekly, he does something that makes me, fall in love with them even more, you know, and, and just be like, wow, there's nobody in any sport that does what he's doing. Right. Right. I mean, that, that guy, like I said, I mean, it's, it's amazing. The, the, what he's done just for, for fishing, you know, just uh, all of bass, you know, bass fishing in general. I mean, it's like, when you think of, of bass fishing, you think of Rick Clun. I mean, it's, he is synonymous to the sport. I mean, he's, he is fishing. Yeah. He's amazing. He's amazing. Do you, do you ever, I mean, this is obviously a business you got to compete and whatever, but as you said, you're, you're self-admittedly a fairly quiet guy, you know, around most people. Do you ever, does that concern you in a world where you have Matt Robertson with fur coats and cut off? I mean, there's, there's a lot of people doing a lot of things to stand out. And, um, I mean, you're kind of old school. You do, you're talking at the scale and, and, you know, you outside of those, you, you don't, you know, I think I said it on day one, when you wait in the big bag, I'm like, you, you underestimate his sneakiness. He's Mr. Deeds. He just slides in with a giant bag of fish and there was no hoopla around it or anything. Does, does that concern you as part of your I, career? I prefer kind of flying under the radar a little bit. Uh, it's just, uh, kind of the way I am, uh, you know, I like to focus on my fishing, you know, uh, especially this early in my career, you know, I mean, we got two years in and a couple tournaments and, um, like I said earlier, you know, it's just about survival and, you know, there's only one way I'm going to survive and that's by fishing and, and, you know, hopefully doing well. So, you know, it's, uh, if I ever go on the classic stage with a, in a fur coat, wow, some, something has changed. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> 
<laughs> that was pretty. That that was pretty bold, I must say. <laughs> he's the most confident guy I've ever met on earth. Like, and oh, I don't it's even unbelievable what he's doing now. Like, he's got some hype around him. It's easy now, but I watched that guy walk into, and he qualified for his first classic through the weekend series. So he didn't even know people from the opens or anything. And I watched him walk in with a fur coat. And I was standing with Skeet Reese and Gerald Swindle, which are the two perfect people to stand with at this moment and to watch their face. And, and I remember Skeet and Gerald were kind of jawing back and forth. And they're like, yeah, but back in the day I would have. And I'm like, no, neither of you would have <laughs> like, just imagine that's the first time you you're seeing any of these people and, and he owned it. And um, it's he's incredible. the only one that can do that. Uh, I, I think yeah, he's just got the look and the, the swagger, you know, to, to pull that stuff off, you know, nobody else uh, would be able to do that, but uh, he's come out with some pretty crazy videos too. I don't know. I follow <laughs> him on Instagram and stuff like that. I'm sure you've seen him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's making a, a splash for sure. Uh, you know, not the way I would, but it works for uh, whatever works for you. Yeah, no, it, it uh, he's very different than you, that's for sure. And I think also what makes it work, and I say this, you, I'm sure you've heard me say this in groups of anglers and stuff. I'm always like, be you, whoever you is, whoever you are, that was horrible English, um, whoever you are, be that. And, and, and the truth is, I remember when I first met Matt and I thought it was all weird and fake. And, but that's kind of the guy he is. You know what I mean? He's like, dude who lives in a trailer park, a double wide and he watches wrestling and he <laughs> obviously was inspired by all of that growing up. But I do believe that, that no matter who you are, even if you are the quiet guy, be who you are and, and be real um, because life must get exhausting if you're, if you're playing a character. Right. Right. Yeah. You got to be yourself for sure. I remember, um, you know, qualifying for the elite series back in 2019, you know, a lot of my friends and stuff said, man, you gotta, you know, you know, have more of a stage presence and, you know, stuff like that, you know, do some crazy stuff. And I'm like, man, it's just not me. You know, I just, I gotta do what I gotta do. You know, I can't be, you know, playing another character. So it's just me. Yeah. You just gotta be yourself. Was that a weird year to, qualify for the elite series like that was kind of the year of change was it not yeah it was i mean it didn't affect me any no um you know in my decision to to fish the opens that year the only reason i fished the opens that year was because they went to lacrosse and it was right here by the house and um you know i thought well in order to get in you got to fish all of them so i might as well fish all of them and you know it's been uh incredible ever since but um yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's what got me started. So, yeah, no, it, it just, I, I would think that, you know, working towards something, all that, and then you come and there's all this turmoil and weirdness going on and you're just like, ah, this, I didn't expect any of this. So what do I have to do to get you in a fur coat and have you chugging beers in lacrosse, Wisconsin this year, even near beer, near beer is fine. You'd have to drug me or something. I, that I'm is not, not against happen. it. I'm not that is not gonna happen. <laughs> uh, I don't know. We'll go out sometime, and yeah, we'll we'll uh, you can have your beer. I'll have my water, but we'll have a good time. Okay, okay. What what um what when you said at the beginning of this interview that there is a side of you that gets loud and rambunctious? What where is that side? Where where is that? Like what? And I'm not asking you to do that now. I'm asking you like when you feel like. You're loud and rambunctious. What are you doing? Like, is are you watching I, sports or you? I I think you saw just a glimpse of it on stage. The I other did. Day. It was yeah. a little. It was tiny, oh, but I loved it. Just it was right there. Yep, it was right there. So that's about <laughs> as crazy as I get, and you're only going to see it for a second because it'll be gone. So what if a sponsor comes up to you and says, "Hey, man, if you're more animated, do a little bit more crazy stuff. We'll give you a little more." Uh, then we're probably gonna have to get along with a little less money, I guess. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> it depends on how much money, I guess. I guess yeah. <laughs> it's truth to every question. Yeah, you want to pay my entry fees? We'll do anything for you. Yeah. But, you know. You'd be so uncomfortable doing it, but I mean, other parts of your life will be so much more comfortable. So exactly. It, yep. it uh, we'll move out of the six and a half foot box. Yeah. 
So do you get jealous? Of, oh, Bob's got like one of the coolest black campers ever oh. in UK. Do you get jealous when you're you're in the hot box? <laughs> Absolutely. I go over there all the time. I'm like, man, can I hang out with you? You know, it ain't so hot in my in my box. So <laughs> but he doesn't have air conditioning either. Uh that's a little Oh no. You know, yeah, not good. Not good. No. Well, air conditioning how did- is everything. How does Pat Schlopper live? Like, what, what what's his setup? I gotta go over to the campgrounds. I think. Yeah, you do. I'm doing it. I'm doing. It. Let's have dinner one night next event. Okay? Can we Absolutely. do this? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. We'll what do, do you it. guys eat over there? Like, what's a McDonald's, night one of the tournament? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's. Uh, I don't think. I think Bob eats pretty well. Um, he's never made me dinner, but uh, he always tells me about the good stuff that he that he has. But. Uh, Patch Lapper, though, he's got a great setup. Uh, I think he bought a brand new camper last yeah. year. Um, and it's, it's a lot bigger than Bob's though. It's a, it's a pretty cool setup, but I think I'm pretty sure he's got air conditioning. Yeah. Um, but he, yeah, he it's fun at the campground the though. Stage. He does karate in the stage. Would you do karate if he taught you? I've never done karate before, but, uh, yeah, I don't count anything out here. I can <laughs> maybe, maybe break dance on the, on the front of the boat, you know, like, I don't know. Davey Height used to do that, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. still still trying to live it down. He did the back, running back man. in the day. Oh, yeah, yeah it was known yeah, it for was, it. So. It was. It was. He had jorts on, uh, which is shorts <laughs> that are jeans. Um, and I think they're coming back somehow. Jorts and fanny packs. What were you like in high school? Speaking of break dance, did did you break dance or what, what, like? Is there anybody in the world that looks like if they stumble across this show and they're like? He was totally different, or or do you think they'll be like, well, that's how he was in high school? Same guy. I haven't changed a bit. Um, I have never danced in my life, so um, and I don't oh yeah, well, you were homeschooled too. What an idiot so, I am! So, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a little more sheltered. So you've never danced? I've never danced in my life. No, I wouldn't even know where to start. To be honest with you, you want me to break dance or disco or whatever? I mean, it'd be I'm, a wrecking ball. I mean. So. <laughs> I just, I'm encouraged. Like, do you think you get through your whole life without dancing or, or at some point? That's the plan. plan. <laughs> really? That's the plan. Is that the plan? Just to survive? The goal is just to survive in the Elite Series and get through life without dancing. I mean. No, that's, the, that's the plan for now. I'm not saying yeah. that things can't change. You know, I'm looking to survive for now, but I'm looking to, you know, be better in the future. So you always want to be one of them superstars, you know, and that's that's what everybody builds towards. So. Who motivates you in the elite series? Like what's an angler that you look at and you're like, man, I'd love to be there one day. Oh man. Well, I mean, I, I've mentioned Rick Clunt so many times, but yeah. um, you know, he's, he's the man, you know, to, to, to be in his position and, and to fish as many years as he has. I mean, that's longevity and that's kind of, you know, where you want to be, dude, if I can still do it when I'm 70 years old, bring it on, you know? Yeah. I'll probably be dead by then, but you know, it's, that's the goal. Well, hopefully, hopefully you're alive and hopefully maybe you're not in the camper anymore, but hopefully you're still on tour. And Rick, Rick Klun is amazing. Like to, to me, um, I could see you making a very similar, one of the things I love about Rick is Rick is inexcusably Rick all the time. And, and so he freaking should be, but I loved one of his posts. We were, it was before the season had started and he put a post up that said something like, I know you haven't heard much from me in the off season, but I choose to focus on family and preparing for the season and not waste my time on social media. And I'm like, there's only one dude in fishing that could get away with doing that. And every like, if I put that up, they would be like, you arrogant little prick. How can you, <laughs> maybe not little, they wouldn't call me little. Um, but with Rick Klund, they're like, see, he's got his priorities together. So that that's where you want to be. You want to be that guy who just, doesn't post and i mean i don't know what, what i post all the time i don't know well, maybe you, you must do. not be uh be on my my stuff but. no i am i'm not i just I, I just you say <laughs> that you don't like to be that outwardly social with people i'm trying to figure you out i mean just sync this to yourself you've won an elite series event and we were gonna cut co- we're covering you and tommy and zona are like tell me about them and i'm like uh he likes Jurassic Park, all of them. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and, and really, I, it comes down. So, so we just want to know. I mean, um, who who you really are, and and I guess 
we're learning who you really are right now. Just learn a little bit at a time, I guess. A L- yeah. little bit. We'll get we'll get out there. We'll get out there. But all right. Most of my my social media and all that, uh, I don't I don't do much personal stuff on there. It's mostly um, you know business and sponsor related type yeah. stuff. And um, but it's you know it's good stuff. So if we do dinner at the next tournament, can we put a post of all of us having? Beanie weenies Absolutely. or whatever. What do I need to bring dinner? Like, do you guys always eat together, or is it just like all for one uh, or one for all? It's pretty individual, yeah. Usually, yeah. Um, actually, me, Pat Schlapper, uh, Alex Redwine, and Jay Shakur went out to dinner this last on our off day, our bad weather day. Um, this last tournament went out to the Cracker Barrel, so that was pretty cool. Um, you know, to do that, but they, that's, a, that's, a, that's how we roll in the elite series. Cracker barrel type Cracker stuff. Cracker barrel. Wow. <laughs> living, <laughs> living large. Yeah. Living large. what do you have at the Cracker barrel? Uh, I had, uh, actually, uh, patch lapper. He, he, that's like his place. So he goes there a lot. Not and shocked. He, he recommended this, uh, I think it was like crispy fried chicken. I think it was, okay. and he recommended it. And everybody at the table had the same, exact same thing. So, and it was good. It was good. It was really yeah. good. I always order what other people at the table have because I, I, I'm i jealous of people. So I order what everyone else have because if I don't, if I go out on my own, I'm always like, ah, that looks yep, so much better it, than what like, I ordered. <laughs> yep. Take this back. Give me one of those. <laughs> All right. Last question. Do you enjoy these kind of things like this conversation or has this been borderline uncomfortable for you? <sighs> It was, I don't mind doing podcasts and, and that, um, you know, doing one with you is a little more intimidating, you know, you're, uh, <laughs> Why? You're, you're, you're a big man in the, in the sport, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know how many people are going to see this, this podcast, but you know, it's gotta be in the millions. So probably, yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So I, I don't think you should be intimidated by me. I mean, so, so who's less <laughs> intimidating, whose podcast was less intimidating? Oh man, I don't even know. I I don't listen to all that many podcasts. I listen to I listen to you a lot. I've, I've probably heard almost every one of your shows. Oh wow! Um, I listen to Luke Duncan quite a bit. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll blur that out. Traveling next. circus. <laughs> we'll cut that. No, no. Um, hey. Who else do I listen to? I did, Matt I did a great Matt podcast Harry. with him for twenty two weeks. Um, Matt Airy does it. Yeah, they do. A, they do a great podcast. Let's talk fishing. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Listen to that one quite a bit. Um, I don't know. That might be about it. A couple of smaller ones, maybe. But. Well, I, I appreciate that we made your mixture of, of podcasts. And when the millions and millions listen to this, hopefully uh, you get some good feedback about it. But I appreciate you spending a little time and uh, let me in to the crystal fortress of solitude. I'm not sure how much <laughs> I know about you anymore, but. I do know that um, you were homeschooled. That's a new fact that I know. And um, I'll see you at the next tournament. Yeah. We'll have to hang out sometime. You know, yeah. it'll, be, it'll be fun. So. All right. All right. Maybe go Cracker Barrel. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll do it. <laughs> Crispy you, fried chicken. That's what we're going to have. Crispy fried chicken. I'm looking yep. forward to it. Maybe the most silent 103 pounds and one ounce ever weighed in in bass fishing, but he's a member of the Century Club, and thank you for spending a little time with me. Appreciate it. There you have it. We saw a little bit inside the crystal fortress of solitude that is Caleb Kufal. He does not dance, has never danced. He clearly is a real-life Rod Tidwell. Do not ask me to dance, Jerry. I do not dance. Um, but we're going to go to the Cracker Barrel one, one time and ha- have a, have a party. Thanks for watching. Take it away. Uncle Bob. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear? <laughs>